Hello and welcome to another episode of Genuine Healing Down Under. My name is Marvin Schneider. Today we are dusting off and repurposing an archive episode of the original Jenny Najami series from way back in 2021. So sit back, take what resonates for you, and if you like the episode, please give it a thumbs up. Here now is the episode. Hello and welcome to another episode of Jen and Her Jammies with me, Marvin Schneider, and the very talented Jen Ward, and of course, uh, featuring Darshian. Hello, Jen. How are you today? Hi, Marvin. Good. How are you? I'm excellent. Thank you. Um, so this is the third episode in the series. What's your reaction to the first two episodes and what have people's reaction to those episodes been? like well you know i'm not able to watch my own stuff or anything so i can't read my own stuff nothing about but i did look at the first not the pilot but the first episode that we did and and your opening question to me it's so subtle but i don't know if people realize how profound it is so you have this successful polished handsome businessman asking me questions and the first question you asked was Jen what are your thoughts and I don't think that's I think it went over everybody's head and mine as well but where in the history of humanity have you heard a man ask seriously what are your thoughts without being patronizing or tongue-in-cheek or impatient so that in itself is shifting consciousness it's really profound what we do here and I've noticed a number of comments uh, highlighting the polarity in, in mm -hmm. a very funny way. So clearly there are polarities all throughout the premise of this podcast. So male, female, the spiritual person, the mainstream person, we've got the inanimate, we're on opposite sides of the planet. I mean, there are just so many polarities that um, underpin the premise of this podcast series and I think that's uh, another way it, it lightens it up a little bit as well, you know, so not too seriously. Um, I understand Darshian is getting a bit of a review. Same, same thing that happened with my retreats. I, I was exhausted in those retreats and everyone said, thank you, Darshan, thank you. And so in all the, all the comments, Darshan's ahead. He's got groupies and everything. <laughs> People are pulling out their anatomists, and he's actually a rock star in the anatomate world now. So, um, yeah, but people love Darshan. And uh, Darshan is dressed up today. Can you talk about that? Well, Darshan has very strong opinions, and he says this: the, the title of the, the podcast is not Darshan in his jammies. So, and he wants to be more like you. He's kind of got a bromance going with you. And even though you don't like to wear ties and stuff, he also has an opinion about, he, he wants me to ask something of people. He wants, he doesn't like buying off the rack because they're not comfortable and stuff and it doesn't fit his body, right? And it's kind of like, you've have you ever had that happen where you got a suit that just didn't fit you right and it just is irritating? Absolutely. So I've bought off the rack in the past, but I don't buy off the rack anymore for exactly that reason. It just never fits. There's something about my body shape that is just a little bit unusual. Well, I, I think I, I think your body shape is just perfect. Thank you. But everybody is different and unique. And and same with Darshan, like um, the tail hole in his pants is not comfortable. It's making him right as scratch. Sorry, Dash. <laughs> Darshan, but you know, people need to know this and stuff. It's not like you're a diva, but it's just uncomfortable. No, it's very important. And it's very important that Darshan has a voice in this series. Um, and that's absolutely the intention as well. So the title of this podcast is, uh, it's an interesting title. Uh, we've entitled it Spiritual Wankerism. And the second term is clearly a, a um, controversial term. It's a harsh term. But, um, and quite often you use harsh language in your work because you're shifting energy. So there, we, we chose the title of the podcast quite deliberately. Can you describe in your view, what is spiritual wankerism? 
Like, just so you know, for, for me on this side of the world, I didn't think it was a harsh word of vibration. I think it's just a fun word. So, so yeah. So I don't think it's a harsh word at all. It's not like the C word or anything or the F word or anything. No, no. It's, um, but, you know, you wouldn't use that term, let's say, in polite company. I wouldn't know better. I would probably use it and not know it was a bad word. Just so you know. Remember when we just started, you started teaching me how to, talk Australian and you gave me all these words that were like curse words and I thought I was just talking like a proper Australian and then you heard my words on the podcast and you said you got a potty mouth I'm going just talking like an Australian and so- and, and and then I said that um you may not want to use that kind of language when you're going through customs you know at the airport because you might get deported straight out I know you hurt my feelings so bad because I thought I was just doing what you said and um, yeah, I get, I misunderstood anyway. So we, we fixed that thing. We did. But I'll, Spiritual wankerism. If, if we so, needed to define what it is, how would you describe it as a, as a first description? What is it? Well, the way why I see it, like when I try to explain something to you of a spiritual nature, like lots of things I... I have come to terms with, I've come to terms with in, um, in connecting a source, like my, like my respect for Gaia. Um, but if you hear it out there, it sounds like pretentious. Like, why do people say namaste, you know? And people use it and they don't use it with intention. It's like namaste. Oh, this is cool. And I look cool by saying it. But they're not, they don't mm. really realize that namaste is linking you to the heart of the other person i see the sacred source in you and it's very profound and when you hear people just namaste this namaste this and then the same brace say well karma is going to get you and they're using they're using sacred um understanding in, in kind of like lower lower nature kinds of ways well would it be would it be fair to say that those that practice spiritual wankerism are misusing spiritual concepts and in a way appropriating them. So you, um, you or your listeners may have heard of the term cultural appropriation is sort of topical every now and then. So maybe, I don't know that. no, okay. So it means, you know, it's okay. But the, um, so is spiritual wankerism or the practice of spiritual wankerism um, using spiritual con- concepts and constructs in a way that they weren't intended and that it takes them further away from source rather than closer to source. Yeah. And the thing is, there's a lot of sincere people out there who want to be closer to source and they want to connect to a community of, of the collective, yeah. which is like connecting in the heart. And so yeah. they think if someone uses this unique term, they know something that they don't. And then they feel like on the outside looking in. Yeah. And as soon as someone is made to feel like they're on the outside looking in and they have to do something, yeah. they have to do spiritual practices, they have to do yoga, they have to fast, they have to be a vegan, they have to stop drinking, they have to stop using anything to be a part of this group. That's yeah. wanker. Yes. Yeah, so in another way of thinking about it, see if you agree on this, um, is... Uh, when people use spiritual concepts um, in a group for the purposes of one-upmanship, so I'm better than you because I can meditate or, you know, whatever, you can't meditate in the way I do, so therefore you're not, you know, you're not on the right path, things like that. So that's actually why I think the adepts um, wanted to work with me because I was always sincere about connecting to source I was always pretty sincere and I always felt like the outsider. And it's interesting because I was never able to like really meditate the way they wanted to or have these profound experiences, you know, like that. I had them, but they're so subtle. They didn't seem like special. Yeah. So I always was made to feel like I was on the outside. And if I felt that way, I know other people felt that way. Yes. So- and, um, and I think it'd be fairly obvious to say that, um, you know, any enjoyment of the physical realm in in moderation is clearly, you know, a, um, a, 
experience and expression of, you know, the human experience in a spiritual context. But moderation um, is well, probably the optimal word. Yeah, moderation actually has a negative connotation as well. Um, I And you're right, the word is moder moderation, but that moderation, that word has been demonized as a negative to someone who's living full of life so i would not use the word moderation as much as in balance excellent okay, so everything so the more that you're going to swing over here with depression the more you're going to swing over here with exhilaration mm. and so that's fine if that's the balance you can maintain but people can't maintain it so mm. they get derailed in one experience so the more that you maintain a balance with something the more you can have it all the time and just um um, experience all the joys of life instead of just getting getting um, derailed by one experience. Yes. Perhaps what we might do, if you don't mind, is let's pick up on some examples of spiritual wankerism and just sort of talk about each one for a minute or two um, to give some examples. And, I, and I, we were chatting just before this uh, we started recording and we've got a few little examples. There, there are many more that we haven't, that we're not going to highlight. But um, so um, what do you say to the spiritual notion that seems to be out there and a lot of people buy into that everything is as it should be, therefore, oh. therefore something. So, so then, right. So, so, so my, so a lot of people demonize me for what I do is because I share truths that have been locked away in, in, in cathedrals and away from the public forever. And they said, and and in this group, I was in this this spiritual cult. It, it collected all the seekers and it, it dangled truth in front of them and they had to pay tons of money or at least money to get it. And I'm bombarding these truths into the consciousness and and the adults were encouraging me, yeah, give truth out. And, and the argument for these spiritual groups was, oh, you can't put this truth out there because it will get abused and people will learn how to abuse power. And the adults have an answer for everything. And they said, well, actually, the people who are going to use truth to abuse power are already using it to the hilt to abuse power. And so what you need to do is pour truth into the consciousness so everybody has access to the same truth. That way, it takes the steam out of them. They don't have something that everyone else doesn't have. So it's a little bit like leveling the playing field. Everyone exactly. has access to the, own un the, the same understanding and, and therefore... Um, higher understanding isn't owned by a group exactly or even an individual because yep. even with what i do so i'm able to tap into consciousness and maybe it came because of the the years of abuse isolation humiliation demoralization deprivation whatever but i have access that other people may not think that they have but it's just because i've learned to listen more and so instead of people like saying, oh, we got to go get it from Jen, got to go get it from Jen, no, that's not going to work anymore. In higher consciousness, you guys are all able to do it like I do. If I can do it, anyone can do it because it's coming through the human psyche. So obviously anyone out there can be as sensitive or as aware or as spirit, whatever you want to put on it, can tap into the truth like I can. So the upgrade is not to come to me for it, but to have me go to you and teach everything that I have, even download my files into the collective so everyone has access to this truth, everyone. So if they they crucify me or whatever, they're not gonna do it, it already happened in a past lifetime. But if that ever happened, the, the truth isn't lost. It's not dying yeah. with me, it's in everybody. Let's pick another one. Don't heal other people um, because they need to work out their own karma. So, the what my adults. So this this was was this was all rules in that spiritual cult I was in, and they actually wanted me. I can read people's 
Akashic Records like nobody's business. They actually wanted me to write a letter to the head grand poopa and ask permission to help people that way. And I'm thinking, why would I ask him permission? If I was given this gift and I have it, that is my permission. So, um, oh, so the, so people say, don't, don't heal them. They have to learn to suffer. So they, they strengthen themselves. They need well, to work what? out their own karma. That's <laughs> part of this spiritual journey. No, that would be true if the playing field was level, but we, yeah. we understand that it's not. Yeah. So um, Reb is our, one of my adepts that I yeah. work with and who makes me really a hard ass sometimes when I have to be in sessions. So Reb Azar says, if you saw a, a suffering dog tied up to a post and he was in pain and you wouldn't walk by him and say, oh, he's got to work out the, himself. He's got to figure out how to get himself loose. No, that's not love. That's like creates that spiritual apathy. Yeah. So, so mm, the lover of God is someone who will go anywhere to help someone. And where you will go is the prison of someone else's human consciousness. Because the human consciousness has become a prison. We weren't meant to be locked in our body. We were supposed to be able to hover and, and have it like a, um, a command post. But we weren't supposed to be locked in here. And the more people talk about problems and pain and 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 issues like that they lock themselves in the body and they can't get out and the only way they can get out is if someone comes in like myself and loves them and <laughs> and shows them how it's not that it's it's they've earned enough experiences they have enough experiences in their cashic records to do it it's just that they have been trained not to so they have to be shown how to do it i think the um the reactions that you're having are just an uh you know a very obvious way to gauge the depth at which you work <laughs> yeah yeah so as we're talking, you know, I'm always doing as we talk and I'm helping people as we talk and you're helping yes. people talk. Yes. So we, we talk a lot and um, some of your listeners might be interested to know that every conversation that we have, none of the conversations are gratuitous and random. They're all working at a level and it, it really is 24-7. For you now too, though. People need to understand how devoted you are as well, because after we do this, we, we look all perky and wonderful. Yeah. But after we're done with this, we're exhausted and we don't even want to like see each other, talk to each other for just a little bit because it's just too exhausting. It is exhausting. And um, um, it, yeah, it, it absolutely is exhausting. What about the concept of karma itself and the notion that karma is some kind of a punishing agent, so you need to work it out. People are making karma out to be like original sin and like, oh, you, it's something to fear, like, oh, you're going to get karma. That's not what karma is. Karma, think of like as a jar of peanut butter. So karma is like, just needs to be spread around with experiences. So if you have so many experiences of like, say, being rich, that you don't have the experience of what it's like to not be rich, then that's going to create this ignorance or this apathy in you. So that karma needs to be spread back out so you can like get that out of the way so you can experience there's different kinds of abundance besides just monetary abundance. There's the freedom of health and being free of time and space and, and enjoying your family and enjoying nature. So, so, so moving that peanut butter out of the way, it's just creating more love. And love is the love is the thing that break up, breaks up the karma. And when people like use karma threaten, they have it's pretty, it's a form of ignorance. The way people use some spiritual techniques or, or phrases just shows their ignorance. Yeah. 
And quite often um, you talk about simply rewriting karma and rewriting uh, soul contracts, those kinds of things. Because, because at the core, we're all love. We're a spark of love. We're omniscient. We're omnipresent. We're omnipotent. And so something happened when we came into a, a vibration and, and the lower realms where we bumped up against a lower vibration and it made a mark on us somehow. And so that became a habit. And then through our lifetimes, that, that reiterated in that same spot because that was a memory and a hiccup. Yeah. So say someone who, who um, bumps into, say in a lower lifetime or something, someone bumped into you like, you know, I don't know. Um, what happens in people's Akashic records is they repeat similar experiences over and over again. Like someone who's been hung in a past lifetime will also have been decapitated or choked or someone who has lung issues. They keep collecting those experiences in that part because it, it, it got attention in a negative way. So what I do in the private sessions is I um, validate the energy of those things. And I say, I pull out all those memories and all that stagnant energy stagnant energy and actually reform the energy field in a purity that was missing for lifetimes and lifetimes ago yes in in closing this episode what would you say in summary what do you want to say about spiritual wankerism and how can you overcome it and how can you not be um held hostage to it what, what, what's what's your what's your summary message? If you think someone has got something that you don't, yes, you have to look at yourself and see what you have that you're not looking at. Don't ever look for the answers outside of yourself. Not even with me. I'm not. I, I'm. That's another point. Is I'm so flawed. It's it's funny, and it's almost like a joke on humanity because I do have some answers here, but. So many people are out there looking for this perfection. We talked about this. They're looking for this martial arts expert with a perfect chiseled body and like maybe a goddess with a perfect perky breast who can walk with no body fat on her. And she can like walk with them in the mist with the unicorn. And that's perfection. But that's the lie. There's no such thing as perfection. There's becoming more and more and more yourself. So the goal isn't to become perfect. The goal is to get that feeling of not being comfortable in your own skin out of your energy field. Wow. That is a profound way that we can resonate and close down this conversation. Thank you yeah. to the listeners. Thank you, Jen. Thank you, Darshan. And Thank look you. forward to catching up with you in the next session. Please comment. Please like. Please share. Bye. Please share. Bye. If you like this content and you appreciate the work that we're doing to uplift all of humanity and to help heal your body, mind, and soul, please consider becoming a Genuine Healing Premium Content subscriber. Simply jump onto the Genuine Healing website, genuinehealing.com with a J, and click on the purchase button on the top menu. Scroll down. There's a premium content option click on that, sign up. It's a simple monthly plan for $20 a month and you will have access to all of the premium content that we put up on the Genuine Healing website. We look forward to catching you next time and bye for now.